thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you haven't heard of us before, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center at the Carpenter House. This is the first of many uh, lecture series. Um, and Derek will explain a little bit more about what we're planning on doing um, and how the next month is going to go. I think we're letting it. All right. You ready for me to go? Yep. Start whenever you're good. All right. Sounds great. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, so what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months is, um, as you may have seen, we've had a lecture series going on. But every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 o'clock for the next two months, we're going to be having different speakers on all different topics of marine um, you know, different sharks, turtles, um, and kind of everything else in between, coral reefs. Um, and so we really hope you can tune in, like I said, every Tuesday and Thursday at one o'clock and really learn a little bit more about um, a lot of the great work that's going on um, and a lot of you know, different projects and just some, some very interesting information um, about our marine environments. So today what we're gonna be talking about are sharks and the role of technology in um, sort of shark research. And so um, I will ask if everybody can kind of mute your screens just as we're going here, just so we don't get any funny noises as we go. Um, I think Taylor will be helping field some questions and things, and there will definitely be plenty of time at the end for questions as well. Um, and so I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see if I can get this right. All right, can everybody see the PowerPoint there? Yes. Hopefully, fantastic. All right. So, <clears throat> let's move out the side. All right, so like today, I'm gonna to be talking to you a little bit about um, sort of some of the different tools and technologies that we use for um, shark research. <clears throat> screen just went blank here so the difficulty there we go all right so <clears throat> if you don't know me my name is Derek Burkholder I'm a research scientist at Nova Southeastern University and I'm very lucky to work with a number of different research groups at the university so uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work with um, the Guy Harvey Research Institute and the Save Our Sea Shark Center um, I'm also director at the Marine Environmental Education Carpenter House and I'm also the director of the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program for NOVA. So we do the nesting beach monitoring and you'll be hearing lots more about um, both our nesting programs and some of the other things going on at NOVA over the course of these next couple of months. So <clears throat> today I wanted to just talk to you a little bit about, again, some of the different tools and technologies that we use to study things like sharks. Um, but just a little bit of background first, um, you know, Unfortunately, as I think many of us are well aware, our oceans are struggling around the world. And so much of the research that I do is really focused on conservation and awareness. And you know, one of the things I really like to bring into all aspects of the research is trying to bring a little bit of education as well. So that's one of the things I'm really excited about with the Meek is that we have a place that we can teach people about a lot of the great research that's going on. Um, but one of the sort of the base reasons for that is like I said, unfortunately, our oceans are struggling around the world. Um, we've got a lot of areas that, um, you know, we do take a lot of things out of the oceans for food. Um, we interact with the, the oceans in a lot of ways for that. Unfortunately, everybody likes to live near the oceans and on the waters. So we have a lot of habitat destructions in these areas. Um, and <clears throat> um, many of our fisheries, so those places we are getting that food, are either fully or overexploited in many cases. So a lot of these fisheries we're taking out pretty much as much as we possibly can, or maybe even more than what's sustainable by the population itself. So every year that fishery operates, that population gets a little bit lower and closer to extinction. Um, many of the species that I work, some of these top predators like sharks and large grazers like sea turtles and things like that, 
a lot of these numbers are going down pretty quickly. Um, but one of the cool things is, you know, we do get to see a lot of pretty neat interactions um, as we're out doing these different studies. You know, a lot of times, like I said, we have a pretty big impact, but every once in a while we see things like this, um, this little guy here who's taking advantage of a fishing boat and has hopped and have a nice little snack there for himself, stolen right off of their table. Um, like some of you guys eating your lunch, you know, just slurp it up off the table, things like that. Here we go. <clears throat> um, but it is cool to see, you know, unfortunately, even though there are times when we do a lot of damage to our oceans, there's a lot of great things coming out as well. And the, the amount of time that we get to spend out there studying these animals really brings some of these things to light. Um, but when we're talking about sharks, unfortunately, many of these are down pretty um, heavily from their, their previous um, population sizes. So, uh, for sharks, some are down over 98% from their historic values. And that's for a number of different reasons. You know, we do use sharks for a lot of things around the world, things like their fins for shark fin soup. Um, we use um, the, their meat for food. You can buy shark meat in many places around the, the country, even right here in South Florida, you can go to Publix and get shark meat. Um, we use oil from their livers for makeups and lotions. Um, teeth for decorations, jaws for decorations, things like that. So we do use them for a lot of things. But unfortunately to do that, we do some pretty major damage. Um, it's estimated that we kill over 100 million sharks every single year around the world. And I'll just say that one more time, 100 million sharks are being killed every single year around the world to be able to um, keep up with these demands. And so Unfortunately, mo you know, these sharks are very long-lived species. Um, they're slow growing, they're late to maturity, and they don't have very many babies at a time. And so when we're talking about taking that many sharks out of the water every year, um, unfortunately, most of these populations just don't stand a chance. Um, there are definitely ways to manage it properly and do things so that it is sustainable. Uh, but in many cases right now, that's not what's going on. So one of the coolest parts about my job is I get to spend a lot of time on the water, out in the field, studying these animals, sharks, turtles, things like that. But it's also one of the hardest things we do. The ocean is a very hard place to work. Um, you know, we're on boats or you know, something like that. For a shark, we might be able to go out and see it for a couple of minutes next to the boat. Or if you're really lucky and get to go diving, you might be able to, to observe them for an hour or two, something like that. But as soon as they swim away, it's very hard to learn more about these animals. Um, and so we do have to use some different technologies, different tools to help us learn about these animals. Um, when we're talking about sort of conservation and management and, and really trying to understand a species, there's some pretty basic things that we want to know first off. Um, one is where do they go? Where do they go to eat? Where do they go to reproduce? Um, what are they doing when they get there? Um, what do these animals eat? How do they catch their food? How do they find their food? Are they solitary? Do they live with other animals? And then how are, you know, humans potentially impacting all of these different things by taking so many sharks out of the water every year. So one of the tools that we can use um, to study sharks in many different species are genetics. So genetics allow us to take, um, you know, just a small sample from an animal and really start to compare populations globally, um, whether it's a small um, population that's, um, you know, reproductively active in a certain area, whether it's regional or global, and it, it really starts to help us parse apart a little bit what's going on. Um, in this bottom picture, you can see the jaw here. Um, this was a for using genetics to um, actually learn a little bit more and try to develop, um, or we're, we're working with somebody trying to develop antibiotics that were specific for different species of sharks. And so we were taking swabs from their jaws um, trying to figure out what bacteria were leaving, living there using genetics and some other tools, and then um, trying to develop some, some species-specific antibiotics to be able to have that in case any was, anybody was ever bit, they would have a better treatment for that particular animal. Um, so one of the early studies using genetics was actually where we started to get some of these numbers of how many sharks were actually being killed each year. You can see in these, these couple of pictures here, there's a lot of fins um, these are all laid out to dry at a market, um, getting prepped to go um, and, and be processed for market. This is what we see. And unfortunately, when this is all we're looking at, this is very, very difficult to know what kind of sharks are there, what species are going into the shark fin market or the meat market. 
Um, when all you're looking at is the fins, it's really, really difficult to know what's going on. And so that's where these genetics came in. And even if we just fin or a piece of meat, we could actually learn a little bit more about what was going on. And actually, Dr. Mahmoud Shivji at Nova Southeastern University um, brought one of the first studies using genetics on sharks. And they estimated that up to 73 million sharks were actually going into the shark fin trade each year. 73 million just for the fins alone. And so it's really kind of put, puts it in perspective as you know, how important some of these tools like genetic studies are in helping us to track and monitor what's going on. So there are some other ways when we talk about behavioral studies um, that are a little more low tech um, and these are just observational studies. So this is sort of the basis of where we start a lot of our research. Um, so this particular picture that you see here is actually from Shark Bay in Western Australia. Um, you can see right down here in the corner of this bit of land here is where Monkey Maya Dolphin Resort is. And um, that was sort of our base of operations. And then as you move offshore, all these darker areas here on the, on the picture are seagrass beds. And so what we were doing is we wanted to know how animals were using these beds. And so we would go out and we would drive up and down in our boats and we would just document when an animal comes up to the surface and whether it's in the seagrass beds, the interiors of the seagrass beds, which is these areas within the yellow parts here where it's a little bit shallower, and then if it's out in the deeper channels. And so, like I said, we would drive up and down these lines and just record what was there. And with that, we can start to look at habitat use. Are these dolphins and dugongs, which are like our manatees here in Florida, or the sea turtles, or sea snakes or birds, are they spending their times in those shallow seagrass beds? Or are they going out to the deeper channels um, where they maybe have a little bit more room to move around, things like that. Um, but those observational studies, just like what we were talking about before with having them next to the boat, they're very limited. We're only seeing them for a very tiny bit of time up at the surface and everything else is under underwater. So that's where these technologies come in. So one of the first tools that we were using in Shark Bay and in many other places is a tool called Critter Cam. So this I know is not a shark, this is a leatherback turtle, um, but this thing on its back right here is Critter Cam. And so this is a tool that was designed by National Geographic. And this is a video camera um, and it's got lots of other toys and tools in it, depending on what um, the researcher was trying to learn about that particular animal. Uh, but they all have the video in them. And what this does allows us to actually get in and see from the animal's point of view, exactly what they're doing, where they're going, how they're behaving. So this is a couple of shots. Again, this is from some of our research in Shark Bay. Um, you can see the back of the head of a green turtle here, same here. And we can see again, from the animal's point of view, we can ride along and see what's going on. Looks a little bit like your dog, right? Go in for a little sniff, see what's going on, maybe a little bump to that other turtle there. Um, but we can ride along and see what's going on. These critter cams also allow us to go in places where it's very, very difficult for humans to go. Uh, for instance, under the ice. And so um, these cameras were used on penguins and um, some seals and other animals. And there's lots of different ways to put it on. These ones went on with a little backpack. There you can see this animal swimming underneath the ice. Um, and we can see from the bird's point of view where it's going. And actually we were able to learn how they were catching um, some of the fish where they're actually pinning them up against this, the bottom of the ice and catching them that way rather than trying to chase them down in open water. Um, for our sharks, uh, we put these on, on the, usually on the dorsal fin, on the fin on the back of the shark. Um, you can see on this bottom picture here, this is a nurse shark. Um, and this was out in the Dry Tortugas National Park in the Florida Keys. Um, and there, we were working with um, Dr. Jeff Carrier um, and Wes Pratt, and we were trying to learn, you know, they were trying to learn the mating behaviors of nurse sharks. and so. And they were using critter cams to try to catch mating activity on camera. Um, and so what they were doing is attaching these to the fin of the shark, releasing them and watching what was going on. Similar thing here. Um, this was back in Australia with the tiger sharks. So we get these nice big tiger sharks next to the boat. Uh, we collect lots of different data on them, how big they are, what kind of shark it is, male, female. We attach that camera, send them off with all of their new jewelry. And then here we can see it swimming along and there you can see the back of the head of the tiger shark as it's swimming over the seagrass beds. Um, and what we found with these tiger sharks is that they are very, very lazy. 
Um, we saw a lot of different times on the cameras where the shark would turn around, it might see a turtle sitting on the bottom, and as soon as it saw that turtle, it would charge forward, it would head straight to the turtle, and as soon as that turtle would move, it might sit up, turn around, and look at the shark. As soon as that shark was spotted, he knew that it was gonna be a little bit of work, so he would slow down and go off somewhere else and try to find something he could surprise. Um, with, uh, you know, with the cameras, we did see him eating things like sea snakes sometimes, um, which usually had their heads down in the sand and their tails wagging up in the water, and they would just grab little sea snakes as they swam by, like a little bit of tiger shark spaghetti as they were going along. So um, again, when we talk about studying sharks and marine animals, you can't study sharks without studying everything else that they're interacting with. Sea turtles, for instance, um, is one of the main food sources, or one of the big food sources for sharks and uh, tiger sharks in Shark Bay. So we were also using critter cams to kind of study the turtle behavior as well. Um, however, these guys, unlike the sharks where we use a hook to catch them, turtles we have to catch it a little bit of a different way. So what we do is we find a turtle you can see swimming there in the shallows, find it, chase it around, jump off the a good boat, swim down, grab that turtle, and hopefully get it back up to the surface. So we can look at that one more time. And again, even though this looks kind of silly, this is the fastest, most, um, you know, least stress on the animal possible to be able to catch a turtle, to be able to get it up and get it to the boat very quickly, work it up and get it back in the water again. Um, and with these cameras, again, we can learn a lot about their behaviors. What we found with the green turtles is that these guys love uh, to spend a lot of times rubbing their heads and shells and flippers on the sponges and rocks under underwater. They keep themselves very clean that way. Um, we did find that they were much more active and social than we had expected. That one, he kind of maybe shoved him off of his, his rubbing spot there a little bit. Um, maybe an aggressive behavior telling him to go somewhere else there. We get some staring contests, which are always fun. <clears throat> And then these animals move on and go out their way. We also found with these, these videos that uh, green turtles eat, ate a lot of jellyfish, which is something we didn't really expect. We always thought green turtles to feed on things like seagrasses and algae. Um, but during that time, we had, you know, we had 17 different cameras that we put out on green turtles. Um, and we only had one, sorry, we had three animals that took a couple of bites of algae. We had one that ate a little bit of seagrass and we had um, 12 of them that ate hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jellyfish. So it was pretty interesting to see um, and something that we really wouldn't have known without using those cameras. So it was pretty cool to see. So coming back to our sharks again, um, when we're working with sharks, one, we do have to catch them. <clears throat> Hopefully this is gonna work. So what we do is we set our lines out, let them soak for a couple of hours. We have a nice big, piece of fish there for bait. We come back and we hopefully find something like this. This is a nice big tiger shark. We pull it up next to the boat. Um, and here you can see the shark isn't freaking out. It's not being crazy. Um, but what is happening is we are slowly driving along with the boat so that the shark can continue to breathe. Um, we're gonna take some measurements. We're gonna put a, a, a tag in its flipper there, or sorry, in its dorsal fin. Um, and that's going to allow us to know that we've tagged it before. Uh, we might give it those critter cams, we might take other kinds of tags, but what we'll do is, you know, with that base information, we can know that we've tagged that animal before and hopefully see them again another time. So <clears throat> one of the things that we're doing here in South Florida is we're taking that sort of tagging program and we're trying to study the local shark community here in uh, South Florida. And so what we're doing there is we've got the Shark Tagging Awareness and Research Program. Um, this is a program where we're working with local school groups and, you know, anybody really who wants to come out with us. And it's a way for us to get out, do the research, and get people excited and involved with the research as well. So every trip that we go out, we have a big group of usually students coming with us, whether it's a classroom of students, and they're going to get hands-on. So they're setting the gear, they're pulling the sharks in by hand. Once the shark gets to the back of the boat, we start to collect some of that data. We're going to see, again, we'll take measurements, we're going to take those genetic samples. We're going to take a sample for something called stable isotope analysis, which allows us to look at their diets. And then we're going to put that number tag on it. So you saw it go on to that tiger shark, but it's a little orange tag that every shark gets a different number. And so if we ever catch that shark again, we can know 
where we originally caught it, how much it's moved, and things like that. But there's some other pretty fantastic um, technologies out there that we can use to study sharks and other marine species. So those number tags are great. They're cheap. They're easy to put on. But they require a lot of tags to go out and usually a lot of time for us to start to get those recaptures. Um, and so with our sharks here in South Florida, we've got probably about 500 sharks tagged now. And I think we've only had maybe 15 of them that we've had recaptures on. Um, and that some of them, us catching our sharks again, sometimes we've got um, fishermen that call us and tell us that they've caught that shark. We've even had divers that got up close enough to read that little orange tag and tell us that they saw our, our shark um, and what tag number it was where they were diving. Another kind of tag that we can use is something called an acoustic tag. So acoustic tags are great. Um, they are a very long lived tag. So it's nice because they can give us a much longer data set than some of these other ones. And that's this little um, white tag here on the fin of this hammerhead. Um, so this little tag here sends out a very high frequency beep once a second. Um, and it, in many cases, we, we use what's called a coded tag. So that sends out a series of beeps um, that tells us exactly what animal that is. Um, and so we can use these tags in a couple of different ways. We can either actively track them. And what we're going to do with that is when we release that shark, we've got something called a hydrophone, a little um, thing that we put in the water. And we can actually listen to that beeping underwater. And we chase that beeping sound around to look at sort of the real fine scale exactly where they're going over a shorter period of time. But then what's great about these acoustic tags is we can also use receiver stations. So this little black um, cylinder right here is a listening station that goes underwater. They stay in the water for about a year at a time before we have to replace the batteries. And anytime a shark swims near that receiver with one of these acoustic tags on it, it'll record when it was there um, and what tag it was. So we know who was there and when they were there. And so over the course of, um, you know, these tags will transmit for up to 10 years. So anytime they swim by one of these receivers over the next 10 years, we can kind of look at their movements. Um, and what's really cool about acoustic tagging is that there's a lot of different people using these technologies and um, different projects all around the world. And so they've got these listening stations out there. And this listening station will record our sharks, but it also re might record somebody else's sea turtle that's got an acoustic tag on it or a snook or you know anything else out there, it'll record on that receiver. And so there's, a, there's some fantastic networks of researchers that will actually share this data. So we might be able to track a shark that we tag in Florida all the way up to New York or beyond in um, this network of all these different receivers. And so we can get some really interesting movement patterns of what these animals are doing. Um, another tool that we use is something called a time depth recorder. Um, so, you know, it's great to, you know, a lot of times our studies, we want to know where their move animals are moving around the globe, uh, but we also want to know how they're moving up and down in the water as well. So that's where the TDR, the time depth recorder comes in. And what this does is this is recording water pressure and will give us a depth of where these animals are um, every second that this tag is on or however we've programmed it. So in this case, this is actually gonna go on a whale, um, not a shark, but you can see this black part here. This is actually just a big suction cup. So this is something that's not gonna hurt the animal at all. But what happens is when uh, we're getting ready, this thing, that there's the tag there that's gonna record the depth. Um, we send that out, it sticks on the side of it with a suction cup, and that's gonna ride along for a few hours or a couple of days. And every second that it's on, the animal is gonna tell us um, how deep it is. And we, so when we get this tag back, we can see exactly what that animal is doing. Is it spending a lot of time deep in the water, maybe foraging or looking around? Or is it up at the surface, um, you know, breathing in this case, or, you know, whatever it's doing, we can get a really good estimation of what's going on. Um, and what's going, you know, what these animals are doing while they're this tag is on. Um, Something that's a little bit of a newer technology that's being used for studying animal movements and animal behaviors is something called an accelerometer tag. So you guys probably all know a little bit about, about accelerometers because they're in everybody's cell phone, all right? So that thing that tells the screen to rotate when you turn it on its side, that's actually just a little accelerometer that's in, this, in, in your phone um, telling it 
that your phone has changed directions. And so on an animal, what this does is it allows us to look at their movements um, in three dimensions, exactly what they're doing on very, very fine scale. And so um, in this case, we can tell if this nurse shark is swimming, if it tilts its head down, if it's rolling over, or how it's moving based on the reading that's coming back from that. We can also see how they're accelerating, how fast they're moving, or if they're slowing down to maybe look at foraging or you know, feeding behaviors, things like that. Um, for a sea turtle, this might look like a crawl up a beach. Um, is it digging to lay its nest? Uh, this is the part where it slows down. It calms down because that's when it's actually dropping its eggs, covering its nest back up, and then walking back out and swimming away back into the ocean again. So, it gives us a really interesting, very, very fine scale look at how animals are moving um, and how they're behaving with that tag on their back. So the last technology I wanna talk about today is something called a satellite. So satellite tags are fantastic tools that we can use to look at the movements of animals anywhere in the world. So there's a couple of different kinds. Um, there are pop-off satellite tags, and then there are tags that stay mounted to the animal you know, for a long, long period of time. So for a pop-off satellite tag, these are ones that we use on animals that maybe don't come to the surface all that often. Um, the Mahmood Shivji has been using these quite a bit with marlin and sailfish to look at the movements of those larger fish. Uh, but there are animals, again, that don't really come to the surface very often. Um, in this case, this one is going on a hammerhead shark. Um, and what this tag does is as the shark swims around, this is going to record how deep it's swimming, the water temperature in the area where it's hanging out, and the location of where it is. And so, um, and that's while it's underwater. So it's, um, as it's cruising around, it's going to store all of that information on the tag. And at a predetermined amount of time, whether it's six months, a year, two months, it all depends on the the question that's being asked, but you program the tag and say after a year, it's going to break free from the shark, float up to the surface, and once it gets to the surface, it's going to actually transmit all of that stored data up through a satellite and back to a computer um, for us to be able to look at where it's been going, how deep it's been swimming, the water temperature where it's been hanging out, to really get a good understanding of kind of what that animal is doing over that time. Um, so like I said, doing a lot of that work with the Guy Harvey Research Institute. Um, with this program, we've been, you know, Dr. Shivji and his team and has been working with many different species, tiger sharks, oceanic white tips, mako sharks, sand tigers, whale sharks. Um, and then, like I said, the marlin, sailfish, and some of those other large animals as well. Um, and this is really trying to understand where these animals are going. As we talked about before, many of these species are in pretty major decline and it really gets, um, you know, many of these wide ranging and far moving animals really struggle as well. And so um, <clears throat> what these tags allow us to do is kind of see where these animals are going. So all these little dots right here represent the track of one mako shark, okay? So this shark was tagged right here off of Ocean City, Maryland. Um, it traveled around, it actually went um, up to Canada. We can see off of the Canadian waters, swam down right through the middle Atlantic past the island of Bermuda, down to the Caribbean, down to the Bahamas, and then back up and was actually found, you know, was, was pinging again pretty close to where it was originally tagged. Um, but what this little track shows is that these guys are traveling long distances um, so we've had some of our sharks traveling up to 15,000 miles in a year, um, and we've actually had animals travel through the waters of 13 different countries over the course of a year. Every single country has got its own set of rules and regulations on how they manage sharks um, and what people are allowed to do, if they're allowed to keep them or not keep them. And so it really makes it much harder when we're talking about these wide-ranging species to try to help figure out ways to manage them. So what we've done is we've actually put this together in a website that you guys can look at from home anytime you want, and you can actually track our tagged animals or the, the Guy Harvey Research An um, Institute tagged animals. So when you open up our site, this is ghritracking.org. That's the Guy Harvey Research Institute tracking.org. 
Um, <clears throat> when you open up the website, what you're going to find are many of the different projects that we've um, been able to, to work on over the years, different species. Um, under each species, you might find some of the different places that they've been studied. So one of the first satellite tracking programs or you know, projects that um, the Guy Harvey Research Institute took on was trying to understand what tiger sharks were doing in Bermuda back in 2009. So if we click on that, um, that's gonna pull up the website here. <clears throat> if you look over on um, the side of the screen here, there's a bunch of different names. Each one of these names is a different shark that was tracked and so if we click on one of these here, let's pick on Harry Lindo. So we'll click on that. We open up this. And again, this, just like that picture we just saw, every one of these dots is a place where this shark came up to the surface, the, the, the tag pinged a satellite, and it sent us an email telling us where that shark was anywhere in the world. And so this is the track of this tiger shark over three years. And so what we can do is we can actually, I'm gonna just minimize this a little bit. Um, make it easier to see. But if we click on this button that says animate right here, we can actually follow the shark and see what it was doing kind of as it was going. So if you look up at the top here, we've got the date. So it was tagged in September and made a pretty quick swim right down here to the Caribbean. So it's only gonna have a date when it came to the surface. So unlike a sea turtle, these guys don't have to come up every day. So sometimes we get long stretches in between um, when we don't hear from them. But this one went down to the the Caribbean and is going to spend pretty much all the winter down there hanging out in the nice warm waters. May, June, and July when the water starts to warm up again, this tiger shark came out into the absolute middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Now this is something we really did not expect for a tiger shark. Um, we thought that they mostly hung out fairly close to shore like the coral reefs and seagrass beds, um, but it spent months out here in very, very deep water with nothing else around. And then what's pretty cool is it made a big swim. Anytime we see these dotted lines, that just means it was more than two weeks in between some in between when we've heard from that shark. So we know that it was here, we know that it was over here, uh, but we don't really know what was going on in between. So what we saw is it went and it spent another whole winter down here. Now we're back into the summer. And what's really cool to me is if you look at these tracks, now remember this shark doesn't have a map, it doesn't have a, you know, a GPS on its iPhone telling it where to go but it's going and traveling to the same places, uh, moving the same kind of pattern each year. Now for the third year in a row, you can see the red now is a change in year, is back down to that exact same set of islands in the winter, um, hanging out, getting a suntan probably, um, and then again, moving back out into that open water during the warm summer months. And so it's really interesting to see how these animals are behaving, where they're going, and really showing how set in their ways, these tiger sharks in particular are. Um, and so this pattern, this is all from one shark. This is actually one of the longest tracked tiger sharks in the world. Um, if we click on this little blue button next to its name, this question mark here, we can get a little bit more information about the animal. So this is a, a male tiger shark. Um, it was about 10 feet long. Um, we tracked it for 1,168 days. And over that time, traveled over 27,000 miles. So it was really moving around. And, you know, we could see how it was traveling very long distances as it was cruising around um, throughout that time. So, like I said, this one was from 2009. So this is one that we um, tracked a long time ago, but um, did give us some pretty amazing information because of how long it was tracked. But what's really cool is that we found that these tiger sharks, many of them had similar behaviors. So this was Harry Lindo. If we look at maybe this shark, had a very similar pattern. It just picked a different island to go to during the winter. So they are a little bit, um, you know, solitary on their own, but still came out here during the summer, just went to a different place during the winter. Um, and so here we can see a similar pattern. Uh, where we have that Tiger Shark Express, we call it, where they're out here during the summer, down somewhere in the Caribbean or the Bahamas during the winter, and making that circle year after year. Um, so one of the cool things about these sharks is that, um, you know, what, one of the, the projects we've been doing a lot of work with lately is um, studying mako sharks. And so ones that... <clears throat> 
um, are pretty heavily sought after for their meat. They're ones that are targeted for um, sort of their, um, their sport fishing side of things. They're a lot of fun to catch. They're the fastest shark in the ocean. So they're, they're a lot of fun to catch on a rod and reel. They jump and flip and flop and things like that. So people do go out and target these animals, but they're also eaten pretty heavily because their meat is you know, a little bit better than some of the other ones. So again, if we look on this side, there's a, we've been able to do a lot of work with, there's a lot more animals here. Um, and if you look at this green flashy light here, these are ones that we've heard from in the last two weeks. So these are ones still actively transmitting. Um, if we click on the fin of this shark, uh, we can see that that point was from May 30th. So just two days ago um, is, or three days ago, that's where that animal was. And so with these, these spot tags, there's ones that are mounted on the fin. Anytime that fin breaks the surface, it's gonna send us the location and we put it back on the website here every morning. Um, it's kind of a fun way that you guys can actually follow this research as it's going on. As we're learning about it, you can learn about it right here on the website as well. So we do have some that did some pretty funny things, um, had some pretty interesting tracks. And so this is the track of two different Mako sharks. Um, they were both tagged pretty close together right here off of Ocean City, Maryland. One is a sort of this orange track, the purple track. <clears throat> And what we see is that, you know, this orange shark was cruising around, kind of doing its thing. And then all of a sudden it did something very strange and ended up over here on the beach. Um, same thing with this purple shark. It was cruising along, got caught up here off of Canada and was landed right up here as well. And so unfortunately, these are ones that actually got caught and killed by fishermen. So this is not illegal. It's just, you know, it's very unfortunate for us because we were learning so much about these animals. Um, and what's kind of funny here is you can see some of these that there's points sort of on land out here, ended up right back down here in South Florida where we are. This is actually the path that the airplane took when that company mailed the tags back to us right here in South Florida. So we were able to contact, we were able to find out where those animals were. Um, both of those ended up being longline fishermen that had caught those who were able to call up the company and they were able to ship us those tags back, which is great because we can get a lot more information off of that tag if we get the whole thing back um, and are also able to sort of refurbish it and put it back out on another shark again. But unfortunately, as you look at the, you know, sort of the site here, we do see a lot of these that have that red dot. And these are all ones that have been unfortunately caught and killed by fishermen over the time that it was out there. Um, and so <clears throat> with this, you know, we, we really learned quite a bit about where they're going, but also really about how much pressure these animals really are under as they're cruising around out there. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty scary to see almost, you know, over 30% of our Mako sharks that we've been tracking have been killed by fishermen. So, um, you know, one out of three sharks are being killed, usually less than a year from when they've been released by us. So it's really interesting to see, you know, how much pressure they're really under um, and what they're doing. And like I said, this site, there's a lot of animals. There's well over 100 animals on here from, if you again, you come back here and we've got the different species, Makos, Oceanic White Tips, some Hammerheads, some of our whale sharks, see kind of where they're going. Again, some of these have been tagged more recently um, off of Mexico here, say cruised over by Cuba and is hanging out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this one, again, we've heard from in the last week or so. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of spend some time on this website and learn a little bit more about where some of these different animals are going. Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can get back to my screen. All right. So, <clears throat> As we've been talking about, it does pose a pretty big problem as far as management goes because of how far these animals are going, how much they're moving in different locations, um, and really is all different sets of rules and regulations everywhere they go. Um, so one of the things that has recently come out in the last couple of years from this research is based on what we just looked at with those mako sharks, with how many were actually killed by fishermen. Um, and previously, all of the management for mako sharks was based on um, a, you know, about a 3% capture rate of the population. So thinking about 3% of the makos are being caught and killed by fishermen each year. Our data from these satellite tags is representing or is, is suggesting it's more like 30% 
over 30% are being caught and killed. And so when this paper was published and showing that big impact, there's actually a lot of push right now to get Makos listed as more of a protected species to limit catches and things like that, which is really beneficial to hopefully helping to preserve this species and, you know, and manage this population a little bit better over time. So these, you know, some of these different tools and technologies really offer us a lot of information and a lot of, um, you know, just, just another way to look at what these animals are doing in places that are much harder for us to go for long periods of time. So it really opens up a lot of doors for what we can learn and how we can study things like sharks or sea turtles or whales, dolphins, things like that. So I know we talk about a lot of things and I would love to try to answer any questions you guys have right now. So if I think Taylor, if you want to help kind of field some questions or how you want to do that. All right, if you have a question, make sure you unmute yours or maybe type it in and um, Taylor will ask me the question. Yeah, I think if you can type it into the chat, then I can get him a little bit easier that way. Because I can't hear anybody right now from this side. So I saw that's what kind of spicy food green turtles are eating. Um, and that was going to be the jellyfish mainly. So if you guys have any questions, you can put it in the group chat or try to ask. Dan, do you have a question? Um, if I haven't forgotten the question, yeah. <laughs> the 30% uh, of this uh, population being decimated yearly my goodness, and they don't reproduce that much. I mean, they don't have that many babies. Right. So there must be a 30%. We don't have uh, the total percentage of all the foil, uh, all the uh, micro sharks in the world. I mean, we don't have that exact amount, do we? We, we must have a, a guesstimate. Yeah, we don't, we don't know this, the straight up, we don't know a straight number for how many animals are in the ocean, but we know that, um, that is not a sustainable number to be taking out of the water every year. And so that's why this big push, once that was determined from the satellite tracking, that now there's a lot of push from the legal side to have them listed as, you know, more threatened or endangered, to limit their catches, limit the time of year they're being caught, things like that, to help protect those and try to keep a little bit more of them in the water. Very good, thank you. All right, so I'm seeing from Connor, is there a specific type of shark that is important to tag? Um, that's a great question. And I think um, it really depends on what your question is. And so for, you know, a lot of the work that I've been talking about, um, things like, you know, these wide ranging species like makos and tiger sharks, um, for me are pretty important because it's, um, you know, they can have a big impact on these areas where they live. Um, tiger sharks in Shark Bay are absolutely the top of the food chain there. And so it's important to understand where they're going and how they're using different habitats because we can see how they're impacting other things in the area. Um, other people might want to know, you know, where, um, you know, something like a Caribbean reef shark might go. That's, that's an animal that is very important to things like the ecotourism industry. Um, and they're, you know, what we found with tracking studies both acoustic and satellite tracking is that those guys don't really move around a whole lot and so they have their small bits of reef where they hang out um, and that make you know that's good for things like a shark dive program or something like that where they know that it, they can pretty reliably find an animal um, but it really just depends on the questions you're asking it you know I think any shark um, as long as you've got a good question these tools might be able to, to provide some pretty interesting information for you great question 
Um, we've got one from Alexis here. What is the lifespan of a shark? That is also a good question and it really depends on the species. There's actually over 500 different species of sharks around the world. Um, everything from a um, dwarf lantern shark, which is about eight inches long at its biggest, um, all the way up to the whale shark, which is 40, 50 maybe feet long at its, at its largest. So there's a huge range out there. Um, there's been some recent studies with great white sharks found they live upwards about 70 to 80 years old. Um, there's actually a shark called the Greenland shark, which is, we think, the longest living vertebrate in our oceans and found that the Greenland shark can live upwards of four to 500 years old. All right, four to 500 years old for the lifespan of the Greenland shark. So it really depends on the species. Great question. So also, how many tags have I put on sharks? Um, satellite tags, uh, I've, I would say probably about 40 now for me personally, but there's you know, a lot of different research groups around the world using these technologies. Um, of just regular tags, I've probably tagged close to 3,000 sharks at this point, I would guess. So there's, you know, I've been very fortunate to work in a lot of different places and a lot of different projects and, um, you know, learn about many different species. All right. Do we have any other questions? Do I tag bonnet heads? Great question. And actually, I have tagged quite a few. So I was working in uh, the Florida Keys for a while and was trying to just get an understanding of what the shark community looked like in the lower keys. Um, and so we did catch a lot of them down there, usually in the shallows or maybe up around mangrove areas. Uh, bonnet heads are in part of the hammerhead family of sharks. Um, they're the smallest ones. They don't get very many, you know, they don't, they don't get very large, maybe about three, three and a half feet at their largest. Um, but they are a very important species in those shallow seagrass and mangrove habitats because, um, you know, again, they're going to be one of the top predators in those er areas feeding on a lot of the small fish and, um, and things like that. So I have been fortunate to tag a few bonheads. Absolutely. They're a very cool shark. So how do we tell that a shark was fished out of the water? I'm guessing you're, so this is from Diego, I'm guessing you're asking based on the satellite tracking. Um, and that's usually just gonna be looking at sort of how the track is moving. So, you know, we're, we're getting positions every time the fin comes out of the water. And so usually we see them not with big movements, unless it's maybe been months since we've heard from it. So we usually see them fairly close to the last position. But if we all of a sudden see a position that's very far away, or more importantly, if it's up on land, that's when we usually know that it's been caught by a fisherman because it's been put on a boat and taken very quickly back to shore. And that tag is still transmitting and pinging away. So it's actually gonna be doing that right from the dock. And so that's usually how we know that it was fished out or caught and pulled out of the water is just because that track or that, that tag is now transmitting from, from the dock or from, from the beach or something like that. Great question. What is my favorite or most exciting experience with shark tagging? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, for me, as far as species, one of my favorite are the tiger sharks because I was able to spend so much time working with them in Shark Bay and just how um, important they are in the area. Um, and also just, you know, they're, they're an amazing, beautiful, powerful animal to see. Um, I'd say one of the most exciting experiences that I had was actually um, working in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so I was part of a research expedition with a number of different universities that was trying to understand the impacts of the um, Deepwater Horizon oil spill on the shark communities in the Gulf of Mexico. So we were looking at deep sea sharks, which was really cool all in itself. Um, we would go out and we would set lines anywhere from, you know, about 900 feet down to several thousand feet deep um, to try to figure out what kind of sharks were there. Um, and so really anything in the deep sea is usually very, very weird. So it was cool to see just some of the different sharks that were coming up. But one of the more exciting experiences 
caught a couple of blunt nose six gill sharks, um, which are a very, very large shark. Uh, the one, the largest one we caught was about um, 18 feet long and probably weighed a couple thousand pounds. So it was just amazing to see that size animal um, and actually bring it up on the boat. Uh, there we were on a very, very large boat, so we could winch it onto the boat um, to be able to tag it and get it back in the water. But um, it was it was definitely a very cool experience to see something that large and that powerful right next to you and you know and on the boat. And that was one that also received a satellite tag from another university. And so it was cool to also then see where it was going and how it was behaving once it left the boat again. Um, <clears throat> So another question about um, sort of the satellite tags, if we're using those pop-off tags, which are the ones that record data um, and then transmit once they get to the surface, how do we know um, if it was just wandering around or if it was one that got caught? And again, that's gonna come back. We, so for those pop-off tags, we actually don't hear anything at all from it until it pops off. And so it has to be at the surface for an extended period of time. Um, and so for that one, again, it, what we wouldn't know originally, you know, right away if it had popped off or if it had gotten caught, but we would still get that, that movement to a dock. So just like with the, the spot tags, we would still use if it made it back to a dock as being caught rather than, um, you know, just cruising around. All right, another great question from Connor. So have we tracked, have I ever tracked any bull sharks up a river? And that's a great question. So bull sharks are an amazing species that is one that is actually able to go from um, full salt water out in the ocean up into full fresh water, like in a river. Um, bull sharks have been caught up the Mississippi as far as Illinois up, you know, up the Mississippi River. So they've traveled way, 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 way up, um, up that river. And I have been able to do a little bit of that actually in the Everglades. And so um, bull sharks come into the Everglades to have their babies. And so we've done a, a number of um, both acoustic and some satellite tracking, um, actually mainly acoustic for the bull sharks because we were able to, um, in the Shark River estuary, there's a place, you know, a whole different series of, of, you know, river and streams that kind of all come together. And by using that underwater listening stations, we could get some really cool information on how they were moving up and down um, in that estuary. And so we did it, a lot of tracking there with bull sharks as well as alligators and some other large fish. Um, and so with the bull sharks, we found that the moms would come all the way up into fresh water and that's where they would have their babies. And so they would pup there and then the babies, the pups would actually live in the fresh water for a while until they got a little bit bigger and would be, you know, a little safer for them to go back out into open water again. So it's a great, um, tool for those bull sharks that are able to go into fresh water, that they go be there a little bit safer, get big, get strong, healthy before they head out to open water um, and then have to deal with everybody else that's out there. So yeah, absolutely. Bull sharks are an amazing animal. Um, so a question from Alexis, how many babies can they have at a time? Another good question that really depends on the species. So there are some sharks that, um, and actually sharks in general, what, the way they have babies is really pretty cool. Um, if there is a way to have a baby, you know, one sort of technique, some shark is gonna be able to do it. So sh some sharks lay eggs. Um, so if you've ever heard of something like a mermaid's purse, it's actually skate egg cases, but some sharks have the same thing where they'll have eggs and they'll lay them outside and they'll hatch out of the eggs. Other sharks will have eggs inside the mom where they'll develop in the eggs, they hatch out of the eggs and then have live birth. Um, some sharks will have an umbilical cord just like we do. So a lemon shark, for instance, um, they're born and they have an umbilical cord. So they've actually got little belly buttons just like we do when they're really little, really, really little. Um, and so there's you know, lots of different ways they have babies. None of them have very many at a time. So I think the highest ever recorded for a shark to have a number of babies at once was out of a whale shark, which again is the largest shark in the ocean. Um, and they think they had upwards of about 400 in that in one of the, the females that was caught and they were able to assess. Um, most shark species are much, much, much lower than that. Um, you know, in this, you know, up to 10 or 15 maybe. 
um, something like the sand tiger shark will actually only have one or two babies at a time. Um, and the reason for that is because the first baby that develops inside mom will actually eat the other eggs and inside the mom and that's how it gets bigger enough to, um, you know, and, and grows till it's born. So um, it can be anywhere from one to about 400, but usually in that, you know, single digits to teens kind of numbers for, for babies at a time. Very, very low compared to many fish species. Um, so how do fishermen react to the tags? It really depends a lot on the fishermen. Some people are very excited about it. Um, we do send things like hats and things if people um, will, you know, record and, and send us information back. We'll be able to send them a little bit um, back for giving us that information, especially for things like satellite tags, if they ever find one and return it. Um, some people are really excited. They, they love that we're learning about these animals and they love to send us the data back. They have lots of questions and it's really exciting to work with those fishermen. Other fishermen, they just wanna catch the fish and they don't really care about the research. So some people certainly don't even re report the sharks that they catch. Um, I think many, you know, some people, if they catch a shark and they see a tag on it, we hope that they release it so that we can then keep collecting data, but obviously, you know, some of them do get caught and killed as well. So it really depends a lot on the fishermen. Good question. All right, why would a great white come to Florida? Great, great question. So um, many times movements of animals is really determined by a couple of things, um, getting food um, and also you know, looking for a mate or something like that. And so movements is really determined usually by those couple of things. And so we do get great whites around Florida every year. Usually they're moving through um, so that this is sort of a migratory pathway. A lot of them live up off of New England, sort of the, the northern part of the U.S. off the East Coast. Um, there's, a, there's a much larger population up there. Um, but we do see, you know, again, through satellite tracking, we've seen a lot of those animals, some that were tagged up in New England, will actually swim down, go past Florida, usually in our winter time in Florida. Um, a lot of them go all the way around the peninsula and they go into the Gulf of Mexico for a while, hang out, and then they're going to go back up to, you know, the New England area again um, over the course of the year. And with satellite tags, we've seen um, similar, there's a group called O-Search that does a lot of tracking of great white sharks. And they see many of their animals doing yearly passes down past Florida, up and down sort of the eastern coast of the U.S. So usually it's, you know, probably looking for food, I would guess, but it's, it's hard to tell. It might be looking for the, the right temperature, exactly what they're looking for, um, is, is maybe why they come down here as well. But that's something that we're still trying to figure out in many species. Good question. So question, do the tags with information written on them, so like the, the pop-off tags, um, do, they do they float? And yeah, absolutely. So um, the, especially the pop-off tags, they're designed to release from the shark come up to the surface and send all that information away. So they've got built-in flotation. Uh, we also do, like especially with those camera tags, the critter cams, and we also develop some of our own cameras using GoPros and things like that. Um, those we always packed in a, in, a, in a foam so that when they released from the turtle or the shark or whatever we were studying, they would float to the surface and that's how we would find them. We would put a transmitter on them um, that we could then track down with, a, with a, an antenna and certain equipment to be able to get that tag back. So yeah, most of those do float um, when they pop off of an animal. Uh, the biggest shark I've tagged is that blunt nose six gill is about 18 feet long that we caught in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I've also um, been able to catch and, and quickly release um, a couple large sawfish in the Florida Keys. They were about 14 feet long, which is pretty cool as well. Sawfish are, they're actually part of the ray species, um, ray family, I'm sorry, but they are, they look a lot like a shark and they've got, they get that uh, sawfish name because they've got a, a rostrum or a nose that sticks out. It's got big teeth that stick out the side. That's one of the ways that they catch their food. They'll swim into a school of fish, shake that nose back and forth, and then they kind of go pick up the pieces of the little fish that they just, um, you know, stunned with their, with their nose. So, or the, with that rostrum. Great question. Have I tagged a black tip shark in Florida? Absolutely. So black tips are ones that um, we do see big, big migrations up and down um, 
the eastern um, coast of the U.S. And so the south end of, you know, sort of Palm Beach area, sort of the middle of Florida and a little bit south of that is sort of the lower end of that um, big migration. And so um, if you ever see videos or photos every sort of winter, spring, um, and then again in the fall, we see this big migration where you'll see all these little dots from an airplane. Those are all sharks. And so there's actually other groups that are studying that migration in Florida. And they've got images from an airplane where, you know, in one photograph, they have counted over a thousand, mostly black tip sharks in that one photograph um, during that migration time. So they're a, a big, um, a really big species that we see a lot of in Florida. And I have been able to tag quite a few of them, both in the Keys and a few locally here in, in South Florida as well. Um, we've actually, I, We've actually caught not nearly as many as I would have thought right here off of sort of Broward County. Um, they get lots of them up north and lots of them down in the Keys, but in our area, um, I don't, we just don't seem to catch quite as many. So it is interesting and something that we're kind of looking at a little bit as well. <clears throat> what if a tag gets destroyed? And that's absolutely something that happens quite a bit. So these satellite tags at the end of the day are a little computer that we strap on the back of a shark and throw out in the middle of the ocean. So it's pretty interesting. Um, that any of them survive, but because it is such a hard place for them to live. Um, but these tags do go out and they do get damaged. You know, sometimes the batteries will die. Sometimes the antenna might break off. You know, unfortunately, we re don't really know what has happened for the most part with those. Sometimes they just get fouled up or they get a bunch of algae growing on them so that the tag doesn't know that it's out of the water and can't send a signal anymore. Um, even though it's, it's technically not um, damaged, it stops transmitting. So that's why, you know, we, we hope to get, you know, maybe a year or so out of these on sharks, but we've had some go, you know, a couple of weeks. We've had some go over three years. So it just depends on the shark and the, you know, the luck of the, the draw sort of with that particular tag. Are there any shark species that I want to see? Ooh, good question. There are many of them that I would love to see. One of them that I would really like to see right now, I think, is um, the thresher shark. That's one that's a you know, pretty interesting species. They're the upper lobe or the, the top part of their tail um, can be almost half the length of their whole body. Um, so they've got this really long whip-like tail and they, that's one of the ways that they actually catch their food. Um, there's some amazing videos of, of thresher sharks using that tail to actually catch their food. And what they do is they kind of whip it over their back and snap it like a whip and they can actually stun the fish in like a school of fish. They can actually stun it with that tail and be able to go get it for dinner. So that's one that I would absolutely love to see. Absolutely is the, um, is those guys. So question is if we put a critter cam or any camera system on an animal, could they knock it off? Absolutely. Um, so Critter cams, all of them, when we put them on, are done in a way that it's not injuring the shark or the turtle or anything at all. Um, so whether it's just a little piece that's glued on, that'll eventually fall off, or like for the sharks, it's just a clamp that goes around the fin. It doesn't cut into the shark at all. And so if they hit that camera just right, they can easily pop that off. And that does happen as well. Um, and that's why we have, you know, the different tracking technologies on them. So when that camera does pop off, we know as soon as it gets up to the surface and we can go out and try to find it before, hopefully before it floats too far away. Um, but that, that absolutely happens. Um, there was a group trying to put these on dolphins, the critter cams on dolphins, and that did not work at all. They had nothing, they didn't want anything to do with it. As soon as that went on the dolphin, just like you saw on that whale, they'd try that suction cup and a couple of different ways to put it on. But as soon as they put it on some of these faster moving dolphins, they would swim, jump, smash, try to knock it off. They'd go right to the bottom and try to knock it off on the bottom. They did not want that thing on themselves at all. And so they would find a very quick way to get it off. So absolutely. Um, what kind of animals have critter cams been put on? Um, there's actually a lot now. Um, again, this is a program designed by National Geographic. And so they've got teams that go out and work with researchers all over the world. Um, I was fortunate enough to put them on, you know, sharks and sea turtles, but they've also been used on seals, many different whale species. They've actually got systems they can use on land as well. So they've used them on lions and hyenas 
and even on eagles and some of the larger birds of prey. They've, they've got bird cams on some of those guys. Um, dugongs, um, many, many, many different species that, like I said, the penguins that you saw earlier. So yeah, lots of different ones. It just depends on who is working on a project that they think those cameras might be useful for. Do we have any other questions? No, no questions, but thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. And uh, the questions were very good and your answers were excellent, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I do see one more here pop up. What if the critter cam stops working? That absolutely happens as well. Um, these are again, very intricate camera systems that go out there. Um, and sometimes we'll put them out and they pop off, we'll get them back and it didn't record any data. Or, you know, sometimes they'll, if worst case scenario, they don't transmit where they are and they were lost altogether. It just depends, um, you know, when you're using technologies in the ocean, if something's gonna happen, it finds a way to happen. So there's as many ways that you can think of to break something. We've you know, it's probably happened with one of these systems over time. So definitely. Um, see one more question. How many different species of sharks are there? There's a little over 500 species right now that we know of. So, but we are still finding new species. So it's, it's always interesting to see what happens. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. And please remember these um, seminars are going to be going every Tuesday and Thursday from the Marine Environmental Education Center um, for uh, June and July. So please tune in every day on those Tuesdays and Thursdays.